piece. Um, but I, I do know there are some good ones and some bad ones. And uh, generally speaking, the more specific. Um, what types of things do you need from the owner? The gross square footage, definitely. The uh, lead sustainability level and the lead rating system are all very helpful. All right, so they're not asking you to determine which lead rating program or maybe uh, participate in, in which one, but the, um, you know, we, we, we find the same thing. When the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, was looking for six consultants for commissioning and six for HVAC and six consultants for the exterior envelope, um, it was really just a couple page document if someone was interested or um, Matt, why don't I just plan on sending that to you so you can post it with the, the PDF for this document just as an example of what um, sure. one agency did for, for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. Usually the owner will know what lead uh, rating system they're going after. In some cases, if it's a complicated uh, program, they may not, and they may ask that in the RFP to make a suggestion. Right. It gets more complicated when the tenant is looking for lead certification and the base building is being done. Um, uh, Matt, are there any um, hands up on this one or we'll move on? Okay, we're moving on to question two, which reads, is there an existing product database that would give the sustainable attributes, recycled content, et cetera, of common materials, i.e. top five products and master specs, so this common attribute can be requested in future specs? Um, of that product. Well, there is, you know, there, I guess my response to that is that there, um, there's a green wizard, there's green format, there's environmental building news, there's the USGBC itself. And there's um, green spec. Um, green buildings, green spec. Right. Um, that, that all have um, data of, uh, of a certain kind. Um, I believe that uh, Green Wizard um, has been marketing that uh, they have a whole template program where if a manufacturer is participating in their program, you'll get that data. Um, I know that on RCAT.com, there are about 4,000 um, manufacturer-generated data sheets where the manufacturers enter their own data, and that's uh, and that's free. That's what I've been told. It, it um, um, it's not as organized as say um, um, what environmental building news or Bill Green has put up, where. You know, if you want five articles on porous paving, you can search for it. If you want to um, do research against a particular credit. Um, so there are a number of people who have put up uh, programs. Most of them require subscription by the manufacturer. And, and so it just depends on whether the manufacturer has wanted to pay to, to participate. So um, I'm not aware of. Um, Usually, in, in my case, when I need to know a particular value, I'll, I'll go to the manufacturer's website because they're asked that question pretty frequently. If you know, if you go to USG Ceilings, uh, it's very easy to find out what the recycled content is. Um, again, just a caveat that um, I know a great roofing system that's 100% recycled content and 100% recyclable. It's made out of paper mache, so it's a great roof until it rains. Um, so don't don't forget um, the normal performance characteristics that we've always looked at uh, for products. Um, it's pretty rare when recycled content, um, yes or no, is an interesting choice. But the percentage is uh, often of less interest to me as a, a specifier. If I know that all metal studs have fifty-four percent, or all structural steel has ninety percent, or most all ceiling tiles have always had 25 percent. Then, then I'm, you know, it just depends on whether you're doing the calculation uh, in the lead template for um, for those attributes. And, and I would second that, Mark. I go to the manufacturer's website first, uh, keeping in mind that uh, the product databases are not not always up to date. Okay, um, Matt, any hands up on this one? 
Um, there was one question that was added to the queue that we can get to when we get down the part of the list, but no hands up currently for people wanting to chime in or give statements. So I'm just typing up the rest of the little notes that you had for that question as well. Okay, then um, moving um, to question number three, how do you resolve the difference between putting all sustainability information in one place, Division One, when subcontractors are rarely div given Division One, <laughs> and then two, should sustainability attributes be repeated in every uh, spec section? Um, Richard, you want to take that one first? Uh, I could <coughs> sure. Yeah. On that I, one. I always recommend that they be put in both places because um, th that is uh, definitely true. If the uh, subcontractors are not always given Division One, if you tend to put the information there, the subcontractor would not get the proper information. So it is uh, worthwhile to repeat it or make sure that uh, the Division One is distributed amongst all the subcontractors. There is, of course, some some uh, um, sustainability information, uh, in particular for LEED or for your particular state. Construction waste management is typically included in Division One, indoor air quality during construction. Lead requirements, commissioning, those are appropriate Division One sections. And you need to decide for yourself at the end of each spec section. Some firms will say, um, you know, uh, construction waste management per Division One section, construction waste management section, so that the contractor knows that um, um, they may have to segregate their materials into different dumpsters if they refer back to Division One, or certain dumpsters are coming and going on certain days of, of the week. But um, it, you can't put all your accessibility requirements in Division One uh, any more than you can put all your lead requirements in Division One. Uh, they belong with the appropriate uh, material, and if you, um, they need to be very targeted. You can have in Division One that you want to get the FSC credit, um, but then you have to decide on a reasonable basis which section that goes in. If more than half of your wood value is in the wood door section, then you may not need that language in rough carpentry or wood casework or wood flooring. Um, and if you don't need it, then don't put it in. It's the shotgun approach of that some lead consultants have taken of gathering all data um, has put a, a burden on the subcontractors that they might not otherwise have. If, if your goals are to know the recycled content of everything, that's fine, but including it in your uh, entrance mat section is really pretty silly because the value of the entrance mat can never tip the value of attaining regional materials or recycled content. Um, and it also can increase the uh, construction bid when they're that's yes. right, across the board. Yes, we've had the case where people have called and said, I can't bid this job because I can't find a door made within 500 miles. And that wasn't the intent to um, increase the cost of the project by just on your record keeping. So um, when you use language, say again using the wood example that says, you follow the lead language that says more than 50% of the wood products have to be FSC certified, that's not a precise statement to a contractor. The contractor just wants to know, do these count or don't they count? And doors, as we talked about in our, our last sustainability group, um, or in uh, floor score, which was the meeting before that, um, please go back and look at those because they're, it's very complex to achieve the wood credit and the floor score credit. Um, um, Matt, anything else on this question three? Um, we did have um, David Sutton raise his hand, so I'm going to unmute his line now. Be prepared, David. You'll be live. Um, and he potentially had a question for us on this topic. So, David, you are live. Hello, Mark. Hi, David. Hello. Uh, twice in one day. Pretty amazing. Yes. Hey, I, I have a question because of the statement made that the subs are not receiving Division One, and I was just curious about the experience since we're seeing much of the construction documents being distributed electronically. Doesn't that argument tend to go away now that we're distributing documents electronically? Well, personally, I, I'm, I've, in the last 10 years, I've never heard a sub saying they didn't get Division One. 
So I, I think that's an, an older argument when someone was going to physically tear apart the project manual and hand something here and there. It's so easy to make the PDF files available, and the print shops always have um, the whole set available. Um, it's, it's like saying, I only got three drawings, but I didn't know that the building was in Alaska. So um, I agree with your comment that um, it's not realistic um, statement anymore to say the subs are not getting Division One. I believe they are because they've had the experience. They have to know when they're going to get paid. They have to know how many copies of shop drawings they're going to have to submit. They're going to need to know whether there's construction waste man management who's paying for temporary utilities. All the things we normally see in Division One that really affect a subcontractor's cost. Nevertheless, I would still recommend that Division One be referred to in all the separate sections, so they're tied together. Well, that's a good point, and there are different takes on that. I know a few people who uh, have an Office Master or subscribe to, like AI Master Spec. There's often a reference to uh, Division One at the beginning of the section. Uh, Dave, are you still on the line? Um, just wondering whether uh, Spec Text still has uh, a reference to Division One, but th that's a good point, Richard. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mentioning the other documents is important. Okay, uh, let's move on to question four. Um, how can the contractor price the helping of the commissioning agent? How can the contractor price the helping of the commissioning agent? Well, in my experience, a commissioning agent, if they provided guide specs, either the, something in Division One or individual paragraphs for the mechanical and electrical divisions, um, they will often let the contractor know that they expect the system sort of to be tested uh, before the commissioning agent shows up uh, to make sure the system is suitable for being tested getting there all the same day and then going, well, let's see if this puppy works, mm -hmm. um, doesn't help the commissioning agent and causes them to uh, have to come back. Um, there is one um, uh, firm in the Boston area that does, um, uh, does you know, project testing, and they, they include the requirement that if the test fails the first time or if the commissioning agent has to come back, um, that the cost of the retesting or the cost of coming back is borne by the contractor. Um, and uh, whether that's fair or not, right or not, they use that paragraph and they say that it, um, it solved a lot of problems because it meant that the contractor would actually test the equipment to make sure it passed before they went to the test to see if it passed. So they looked at the commissioning agent not as a helper, uh, but just as a, um, you know, the official record keeper. Um, and I would add in the specifications that the contractor have experience with lead projects to, to address the uh, commissioning, helping of the commissioning agent, because they have experience and they know the commissioning process, and, and they should know when they need uh, to assist the uh, commissioning agent. Well, but there are different levels of commissioning. I don't think it's I don't think it's clear. And as much experience as we'd like the the contractors to have, they don't always have it. Um, there's always a first time. There, are many. You mean versus uh, well, there are many construction versus, uh, enhanced. Yeah, I mean there are many there are many contractors who have lead AP people or people who've been through, but it doesn't mean they've been through commissioning before. Mm. Um, so the question is, how can the contractor price the helping of the CXA? I guess the question is, what the, the real answer to that is, how does the contractor make sure the subcontractor um, has got the system in good working order before someone comes to test it? Mm -hmm. And um, they can likely push that, co that cost back on to the subcontractor because they're the ones who, who've done it before. Um, 
Any, Matt, are there uh, any hands up on this one? Um, there's a couple of things. First off, um, our phones here at CSI shut off, so I am now on my cell phone. So I missed about a minute and a half of that conversation. Um, but uh, we had a question related to that that I don't think we've addressed yet, uh, which I'm going to throw up on the screen now is kind of a question 3.1, um, which is if the material spec that we state um, or refer to in Division One section um, are in Division One sections, whose responsibility is it to get that then in the hands of the sub? Um, and I don't think we necessarily got to that point, so I just wanted to bring that question up in case that was something else um, as well. Well, thank you, because uh, of course the um, the contractor is the one putting in the bid or responding to the RFP, and they're responsible for a, a complete project in place. And so it's the it's the general contractor's responsibility. Um, the architect is not involved in how the, whether the contractor goes to one or two or three subs, and and is not in charge of policing. Um, uh, whether the the bid is complete, sometimes this comes to light when you know bids from different contractors come in, and one painting bid is at one price, and one painting bid is at twice the price, and then you realize someone hasn't understood the scope, and you try and have a meeting to clarify that. In uh, public bidding, in in some states where um, uh, the subcontractors have a little bit more rights, um, again um, the agencies make make the full documents available. Um, I don't know of any owners who uh, parse out documents uh, section by section. I don't, I don't doubt that some contractors do that, but um, again, partial drawings, partial specs, uh, subcontractors really can't, um, can't deal with that. Um, any anything on that one, Richard, or should we move to the next? No, no, I have no no other comments there. Alrighty, and then related to that, then there was oh, there was more of a, a statement. If anything else, then also with that from Joseph Antarella, stating that to just also note from his experience, spec text um, references Division One in each section, um, but not in the same way that master spec does. So I don't know if that was just something more aligns. Um, as a heads up for everybody, or if you wanted to comment on that a little bit. Well, sometimes in a document like spec text, when you go to submittals, it will say, you know, submit the following in accordance with Division One, or you'll go under um, uh, project meetings, and it will uh, refer back to Division One. And Master Spec does that as well. So um, either approach is is fine. It's in my opinion, it's just a matter of what uh, what you've decided to do in your your own office that, that makes sense, and um, um, you know avoids avoids problems. Um, I, I can't imagine not uh, a subcontractor, um, you know, being forced to guess, but of course they do. You know the. Architect works on the job for a year. The contractor gets a month to bid it. The subcontractor has it for a week, but doesn't get to it. And they've got four hours to put together a bid. And um, they all have their own strategies. Some will go to the um, Dodge plan rooms to take things off. Some will, um, you know, the painting sub told me that they go to the door section and the Miss Metal section. They don't look at the painting section because they know how to paint. Um, I don't know that that's the right answer either, but um, it's uh, each to their own. Okay, I do have one other comment for question number four on good specifications for commissioning. I've seen the commissioning agent lay out the responsibilities of all team members, and they go into detail what's going to be commissioned. So. Uh, having the contractor or the subcontractor read those commission specs could be helpful in, in the pricing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know Master Spec has a commissioning agent, I believe, a section, I believe, uh, Spec Text and BSD and the UFGS, uh, all these um, um, nationally available uh, programs have commissioning sections and the trade associations that deal with commissioning have them as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, question number five, do you provide Excel spreadsheet 
examples in your specs. Okay. USGBC has a pretty good one. Should oh. you provide the link, they tend to change locations on links. And uh, just wanted to sh did we go over question four already? Because I know yes. we sli slipped in yeah, three point one. Sorry. All right. Because I'm just I'm switching between phones here. So I'll make sure that question five is up on the screen now as we get going here. So. All right. There we the go. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand this question. Excel, Excel spreadsheets for what? Well, I, I think that um, based on my reading of the question, I, I have seen uh, some people download uh, lead templates and put them in the um, in the spec. Um, templates uh, or there is also a, an MSD, uh, you know, the the product sheet in Division One that tells people, you know, if you're submitting for a carpet, you know, what's the CRI number or um, things like that to to facilitate entering the template on lead. But, um, you know, there was, um, in again, in the Boston area, the USGBC chapter meeting last night, uh, Peter Templeton, president of GBCI, and um, some of the uh, USGBC folks were there and um, they are in the online program considering making it available so you can download a template, uh, work on it, and then upload it instead of having to uh, do it live. Uh, do it live, which um, necessarily takes more time because you're dealing with their computer systems. So, mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes, the USGBC um, spreadsheet for individual credits. I mean, is that, that a is that a um, checklist? Yes. Referring to no, I mean, I, don't you find? Uh, I think it's almost a rhetorical question. Of course, USGBC has excellent templates because they're the USGBC templates. Right, but I've never seen those in specifications. If you're referring to uh, okay. template spreadsheets. All right. So, would you see any advantage in in including no. those? No, I, I wouldn't see any advantage. All right. So, if a template required a, a manufacturer's certification page or the different things that uh, it, you mentioned last month, then you just asked for those things. Absolutely, and it should be in the spec that they be provided. But including the templates, uh, I think that's. And um, yeah, we have a clarification, I believe, here. Um, and I, I can't seem to find Linda on my list of people that are on the call, so I can't unlike, un unmute her here. Um, but she clarified here um, for the materials credits for question five, mm -hmm. um, MR credits, not templates. So I may have, on my end, just gotten the question slightly wrong. Okay, so a spreadsheet of um, materials and locations of manufacturing and raw materials? I believe so. It just said uh, for question five related to MR credits yeah. um, and the materials credits. <laughs> I, I still don't see how it would be helpful because there's always options of uh, what material you can use. So what are you going to put in the spreadsheet? All the options? Well, you could create the columns if, if what you're looking for, again, if you're looking for data from a subcontractor that they can go back to the manufacturer to ask. Um, it's probably easy enough to put what those things are um, as opposed to asking a contractor to fill out um, um, a spreadsheet. With regard to the second part of that question, um, what about links, um, it's never been uh, my experience to include a live link in the specification because I have no control as to whether where that link goes. When I set it up, it might have gone to USG Mars uh, Climate Plus ceilings, and two years later, it, it may go nowhere. It may go to a different USG ceiling, and I really can't take that risk. So, yeah, Or it might be dead. Or it might be a dead link, in which case the contractor would say, well, I couldn't get the information, and I didn't have time to ask, and so this is what I bid. So I think in a, in the BIM, a BIM environment where you can put in hyperlinks, um, I, I think it's um, if we could get manufacturers to agree um, that once a link is established, it, it doesn't change. But um, with the rate at which manufacturers' websites are updated, that's happening all the time. And uh, most manufacturers, I don't know any, in fact, who who have a migration path, every now and then you, you click on a link and it says you're being redirected. 
I think we've all had that experience, but that's usually to a whole website and not a, an individual page. So I wouldn't rely on that link to have the information that a subcontractor needs. You might want to do it just for convenience so that they could maybe find out the 800 number or who to call or, you know, who's the local rep or, or things like that. But those aren't, um, those will be more relevant to the BIM model when there are more active players um, and it's not just a, a spec issue. But when you're only talking about specifications, uh, in my experience, um, I think the link can only be there for information, not for something relevant. Mm -hmm. I think I'm getting the gist of question five now. When I conduct lead kickoff meetings, the contractor will often ask for a example template, and I do provide the, these spreadsheets, and it helps them see what the targeted materials are, and gives them a, a sense of the overall plan. So maybe that's what the uh, gist of this question was. And well, and Richard, when you ask sometimes in Division One when you ask for a, a plan on, on how they're going to achieve a particular credit, mm -hmm. um, then they would need that spreadsheet as well, right? Well, then I would just refer them to the uh, lead online template because that's the simplest um, way of doing it. And, and, no. and so you just give them an active link so they can view. Yeah, and, and lead also has um, sample uh, templates that you now can go, go and download without right. being a member of a team. And that, right. that was lacking in the past, so that's what I would refer them to. Because that's a very simple tool, and it's, it's all laid out for them. Okay. Um, Matt, anything else on five? Otherwise, we'll go to six. It doesn't look like it. Uh, Linda didn't know that she was going to try to look for a link, so she may come back to that later. But at this point, it looks like we can move on to question number six. Okay, question number six. How do you deal with or handle the review component material documentation? for both recycled content and regional content by weight um, or cost. Richard, do you want to address that? It's always by weight, which may seem weird because with concrete, the, the majority of the cost is with the um, cement. Cement is the majority of the cost of uh, concrete, and when you do it by weight, uh, then that uh, diminishes the contribution. One way around that is to separate it out of the concrete, but in most cases, doing it by weight is the simplest and the fairest way of um, pursuing the uh, local material credit. Um, and recycle, too. Um, all right, but so if you're looking at um, FSC and you're looking at a percentage, that's by cost. There's always exceptions. FSC is by cost. So they would have to tell you by cost what the um, the Senate. Well, in the example, too, in the, in the question where they say wood cabinets, um, again, are, are you saying that's by weight? I don't know how that... Um, no, wood cabinets would, if it's a... Uh, an FSC pursuit that would be by cost. Right, FSC but is cost. But um, so recycled content is by weight. Is by weight. Yeah, and that's defined by lead. The same with local materials. And the the regional materials are by weight by, or by five hundred miles. Right, but you can have a portion of a product that's local and a portion that's not, so you would define that by weight. All right, so if, um, all right, so victory to the heavy things in the world. <laughs> right. Um, so if, if you had a composite material, there's steel and a wood, the steel may not be local, but the wood may be, then you would take the percentage by weight for the wood as local, but not the steel. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that goes along with, uh, and that's explained pretty well in the um, issue. It's it's interesting how the um, how the topic is sustainability, but the subject is always lead. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Matt, anything else on six? I am not seeing any additional statements or questions related to that. So at this point, should we move to number seven? 
Okay, question seven reads, for SSP1, do you provide an inspection log? Example one, a maintenance report for the erosion and sediment control log page. Uh, Richard, perhaps you could address the documentation that, that you'd want to see for SSP1? Well, they have to have a erosion and sedimentation plan. <clears throat> for lead um, purposes, you, you have to provide a plan. And then you have to show how you're going to implement that plan. Now, should you have an inspection log? I mean, you could. Uh, well, if that credit is audited, is having a plan enough, or do they audit the fact that the plan was followed? Yeah, they, they could. They'd want to see um, via the drawings that the plan was implemented um, by showing what had to be done uh, through the drawings. So if the drawings showed a, a row of hay bales right, or an erosion exactly. mat, um, uh, would they ever request a photo? Uh, I've never seen them requesting photos, but they may want uh, copies of the drawings uh, along with the... Uh, and, the and the assumption is that the, uh, the architect would um, uh, enforce the requirements of the drawings or the civil engineer yeah, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the civil in that case. Um, and I would, um, looking at the example, given the maintenance report for the erosion and sediment control log, um, there may be, um, if there was a, an owner's rep on board, if there, it was a, a public uh, agency, they would probably include um, in their notes um, any changes to um, whether those um, procedures were being, were being followed or whether a storm had washed them out or whether a snowfall had covered them up. So sure. Or whether the bales were put there in the first place. Right. But true. And you could use that in a sense as an inspection log. If it's a so it, it'd be good practice for your job, but it doesn't sound like um, um, LEED has uh, requested that. No, no. They request the erosion and cementation plan and how it was implemented. Okay. And, um, and you can uh, show that by including the drawings. Okay. Uh, Matt, do uh, anything else on 7? I'm um, looking here. I do not have any hands raised and no additional questions at the moment. So we can move on to 8. Um, do you right. know that Linda did get me the link, so I'll be getting that ready to go back at some point, potentially back to question 5. So just keep that back in your mind. All right. Uh, Matt, could you uh, read question 8 because I don't have it in front of me. Yeah, sure I don't have it either. Oh, there sure. It is. it is popping up on the screen right now, yeah, uh, which now. is... Uh, what is going on with LEED certification? So a very general question for you all to answer here. Well, I wanted to, um, again, this was uh, addressed at the USGBC meeting. Um, of course, um, there are um, 162,000 people who have taken the test now. If you had LEED AP after your name, you may keep it forever. If you want LEED AP BD and C or LEED AP CI or LEED AP and D, uh, the body of knowledge changed since 2007 to 2009, so you have to take uh, some coursework or you have the option of taking the test. And so um, if, um, if you, and it would just be the test for the, I guess, the portion of the work um, or the, the new pieces. But uh, the um, US GBC people pointed out that you will always have your lead AP. Um, they went through an uh, ISO standard on um, uh, doing testing on a body of knowledge. And so the new certification or the updating, the 30 hours you'll need every two years um, is, uh, is very rigorous. Um, there are eight ways to earn it. Um, working on a project uh, helps, especially if you, but you need to be either the lead AP or you need to be um, uh, be the person assigned to achieve a credit. Um, the, there's also um, everything from self-study to AIA credits to um, webinars. They did point out that um, for $2,500 a year, a, f a firm could sign up for USGBC for their webinar series. Uh, on an unlimited basis if they wanted to. So even if your firm had a thousand employees or your firm had ten employees, the, the annual fee is $2,500. Um, so much for the plug for them. Um, 
Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that if you do want this the specialty certification, um, that uh, you do need to to sign up, and you'll have two years, uh, likely from the time when you signed up to, or um, to achieve those credits. And and there's a, a wizard that helps you um, calculate that. It's um, it's uh, 30 hours is is more than any other organization I know that requires. Although um, it's, 30 it's 30 hours, hours for two years. Two years, yeah. So it's around the same as AIA. Slightly less, yeah. and there's also uh, articles in magazines like McGraw Hill, where you can right. capture. Right, but credit. six of the six of the hours have to be um, on the lead program itself. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, you can go to their website and and sort through the 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 different pieces. Um, so that's what's up in lead certification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to add a comment there, although lead claim that you can keep your lead AP, it is going to be phased out. Because at some point down the road, they're going to require, for example, if you're doing a lead for new construction, you have to be lead building design plus construction certified in order to um, sign off on that credit. They won't right. accept it's just the lead AP. Right, but so, you may still always call yourself a lead Yeah, AP. that's true. but. It, very soon it won't be useful. So that should be added. Uh, eventually you're going to have to upgrade if you want to, to stay in the uh, lead certification. Uh, well, and then there was also brought up at the meeting that, you know, gee, this firm does architecture and interiors. Are you supposed to get two? Yes. Yeah, you are supposed to get two. It, when, when that does come around, you, you will only be able to sign off on the discipline that you're a, a disciple of or that you've taken an exam in, like building design and construction, and you can't do commercial interiors, for example. Or you can't sign off on the template. Not to say you can't do it. Oh, boy. Yeah. OK. So, so you, you, you'll, you'll be seeing multiple um, certifications uh, in new consultants if they uh, do Okay, so that is a, so there is that 30-hour requirement. I guess they they just oh no, and then it goes higher if you're you have two disciplines, there's more hours. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I asked the question. Um, I guess there are over 90,000 projects that are now s registered for LEED certification. About 40,000 of them are homes, and about 4,000 of them are in foreign countries. Just some statistics that they were. Um, that they were sharing. Um, in uh, their 15,000 member organizations, they representing as many as 14 million people in firms that are um, USGBC members. Um, can we advance to the next question, and if you could read it? And it is coming up now. Question number nine is, and I pulled them nicely, um, does the lead language and specs really need to change for the different versions slash programs? Well, that sort of ties in with an earlier question of where do you put the information. But in our own specifications, uh, we need to know whether it's lead for homes, lead uh, for CI, commercial materials, lead for new construction, because we have separate paragraphs. That's, there's, there is no one language fits all. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, do you uh, concur? Yeah, with I, I would uh, second that. When I review specifications for lead compliance, that's uh, quite often a um, correction I'll have to make because it's going to mislead or confuse the contractor if you have a credit in the spec that doesn't belong there. That's so particularly um, evident with the interior finishes. Yes, it, exactly. So it, it, uh, the, the specifications should be in line with uh, the rating system. And they don't vary by that much, but there there are some uh, very distinct differences. Um, in and there's also the some credit some credit numbering differences between the lead CI and the uh, number of credits available. So Yeah, definitely the number of credits available. They do try to keep the numbering system the same, although the, the name of the um, the credit might be different, but the, they, they try to be consistent with the numbering system. OK. Um, um, 
Hopefully that was self-explanatory. Uh, Matt, you want to move to the next question? Just one second. I am getting some typing done here as we go. Because I'm doing it one-handed at the moment. Um, but question number nine, so we are now into question 10, which will be popping up shortly here, um, is, um, is there any updates on what is happening with both uh, LCAs and EPDs? Well, the uh, for those of you who get um, um, environmental building news, there was, and other organizations, UL Environment um, has bought Green Guard. They've bought Echo Logo, and now they've announced an EPD program, which is Environmental Product Declaration, so that um, the world can discern between two manufacturers of the hmm. same item. Um, you know what what's going on. If, if you don't have apples to apples, of course you can't compare the the uh, PCRs. I think that's what it's called, product classification rules. Um, so UL Environmental has taken on developing the rules for as many as uh, 300 different uh, building product types, and it's an immense task. And based on their credentials, they might actually be able to do it, which would be t a tremendous and uh, benefit to uh, the rest of us. Um, uh, life cycle assessment. This is a, another issue. Is to um, um, people certifying their products, their plants. Um, the president-elect of CSI, Paul Bertram, is currently the sustainability director at Kingspan. And they say that they have, um, I guess, available now the LCA of five of their factories, and that uh, Kingspan has uh, produced uh, an EPD, an environmental product declaration. And if you look at the IS, I, ISO standards. Uh, we talked about this on a previous um, in a previous meeting. There are three levels of declaration. One, which is um, uh, a manufacturer provides their own numbers. Uh, the second is when I believe they provide their own numbers, but it's verified by someone else. And I believe the third is when it's done independently. Um, that's probably not a precise enough explanation, but LCA and EPD will, will um, go far beyond the, the few items that um, USGBC is, is looking for now. Um, when they come out with their next version in, in 2012, although they're not going to call it 2012, um, it's not tied to a particular date. Um, the, you know, I, I believe that they will advance into these areas too once once that the the um, industry has um, sorted things out. It's 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 sometimes hard to remember that um, in 2011 our industry is still a little bit backward. It it took a for example a, um, a grant to CSI by the HVAC industries and SMACNA to a, to standardize HVAC terminology and and there there is no one to standardize carpet terminology or lighting terminology the the specifiers property information exchange is moving in that uh, direction NIDS and CSI are moving in that direction but um, for some reason it's all brand new and maybe it's because the automation is finally sophisticated enough to uh, allow us standardization. The communication is so imperative as we're able to talk locally and around the world. Um, and, and there's still more research going on in LCA. It, it's also my understanding that the, the next lead version will have more LCA um, contribution in the uh, scorecard. Great. Uh, Matt, did you want to go back to that link, or was there an, uh, one more question you wanted to? There, there is a question 11, and actually we're talking to Linda. I said I would forward her information on to both you and Richard after the call, and perhaps we can discuss it independently and see if it might be something that would be addressable in a future call. That way then it helps her out, and that way then we don't have to kind of push and prod and hope we get an answer that works. Okay, so then, uh, yeah, so we can move on to, to 11, and then... Yep. Um, can we, can we just back up to nine? I, I thought of a good example, um, the question about does it really matter if we change the uh, lead specs based on the rating system. One a good example uh, of um, the uh, negative impact is uh, furniture. 
where commercial interiors, it's a requirement to include furniture, and that can make or break the recycled or local material points. But under new construction, you don't need furniture, so you would not want to include it in there. So it, there are some subtle differences that can greatly impact the, the rating systems. Okay, well, it, um, I think 11 is the last uh, question in our list, and it's um, we've got a few minutes left in the hour, so why don't we move on to 11 and then uh, okay. announce what's happening next meeting. Sure. Let me just finish typing what Richard just said here, and let me move over to question 11 here, which should be on everyone's screens momentarily now. Yep, that's up on um, which question 11 states, um, does specifying recycled content for different structural steel products cause more problems than it helps? And then it states for their understanding um, is that if steel is sourced from the U.S., it's easy to state the minimum recycled content per AISC published figures, and one may spec uh, to help ensure overall lead MRC4 is met. But does it cause problems uh, when to meet schedule steel is shipped from overseas? Well, I mean, my, my take on that, on this question about the recycled content of an individual product is that sometimes you will, you will want steel or studs or ceilings to contribute to a credit, and so you can set a minimum threshold that you believe everyone can meet, but to set a number that only one manufacturer can meet is a fake spec. And um, in my experience, uh, whether it turns out to be 60%, 80%, 90%, um, as long as you've got a manufacturer saying that's what it is, um, I believe that would be good enough for lead and would, would be useful. So um, you don't have to be quite that predictive in a spec. You might set a minimum, but not a, an absolute. Um, Richard, do you find that when uh, people submit that the percentages sort of go up and down based on which manufacturer? No, no, at least not in the Northeast. It's pretty high. It's consistently 90%. And I don't know if you're going to get the documentation if you were to buy steel overseas, if it was cheaper to barge all, all that uh, steel weight across the oceans. But we've never had an issue with... Um, calling for 90 percent to recycle steel and uh, we usually get it right but and um, no, but someone wouldn't make something special for one project so they would likely if they if they needed to rely on the ASC numbers but you know some steel comes from Canada so it didn't cross in the oceans and my guess is that those people have been asked this question enough times that they they also have an answer it's the same way with miss metal when um, somebody will report their recycled content for the year uh, because they won't know how much recycled content is in this, in this particular stair or this particular grading, but they'll know what their average is for the year. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure I, I buy that argument. Uh, or using a trade um, published figure, the large steel manufacturers are happy to give their recycled content. So why would you have to rely on the, on the average? And it's usually much lower. So instead of getting 90, you might get 40 because you're taking the average. But I don't understand that argument. OK. Well, then um, um, that's what it's hard to get you know, from the large manufacturers. Then, yes, but they're more willing to provide the uh, need documentation. Right. I mean, steel is one of those materials that never went into a scrapyard anyway. The, That's right. It's always had a, um, a monetary value, um, same way with aluminum. It's just a matter of how hard it is to collect it or not. Um, and those people now, they're going through all the old landfills collecting all the metals. Um, well, good for them. Um, um, Okay, um, Richard, I believe you had set up a topic for the next um, meeting, or is that still in flux? No, I set up a topic for May, not April. In May, uh, Jennifer Atley from uh, Building Green is going to present a seminar on green product certification, so picking up green from Greenwash. Uh, they've just done a... Uh, a report on uh, green certifications uh, in the United States, and there's close to 100 certifications now, and they help to explain 
uh, the various uh, certifications in the uh, pluses and minuses of these uh, systems. Okay. But that's for May. All right. Not for April. All right. Then uh, within the week, we'll um, send an email out as to what um, is going on in April. Typically, it would be the um, uh, third um, Tuesday as usual at, at the same time from from uh, three to four. And, um, and at the same time, we'll include May's um, uh, description as well. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, is there anything else live on the um, on the screens or the questions? There is, I just put there is no more questions. I put live on the screen right now. First off, the third April, uh, the third Tuesday in April would be April nineteenth. So everyone can start planning for that on their calendars. Um, but then I just put up a couple of additional sustainability resources for everybody, um, which includes um, just csinet.org slash sustainability. That'll take you to our homepage uh, for the sustainability practice group. And if you haven't been there recently, I recommend you take a few minutes. As like I said in the beginning, um, all of our calls for the, um, for the last few months or so have been recorded and then recording video as well as notes, PowerPoints, or PDFs are accessible directly on the site through the meeting's archive page, as well as some additional links and some uh, heads up kind of news articles related to any upcoming webinars or other information that might be helpful um, for people interested in sustainability. Additionally, as we mentioned, I believe on question three about different product um, listings related to sustainability attributes, if you wanted to check out CSI's version of that, uh, you can visit greenformat.com to get some information on that. Do keep in mind we have free webinars once a month, um, both for designers and specifiers and manufacturers on green format. So you can check the website again to find out information on those and sign up for our coming meeting. And then lastly, there is a link on the screen which you can also find directly again from csinet.org sustainability. And that's for our forum. So if you go to csinet.org and look for the forums tab, there is a special forums area in there specifically to sustainability. So that might be something for you all to be interested in as well. Uh, and then just lastly, there's my contact information up there on the screen for you. But also note that I am in the middle of working with the IT staff here to create up an email address, just sustainability at csinet.org, which would be a great way for you to be able to send information or questions similar to kind of like today to that. And that information would then go to myself as well as Richard, um, Mark, and a few other individuals that have expressed interest in helping with sustainability issues. Um, so that's kind of just the wrap up up for today. Um, I don't think there's anything else we need to talk about. I don't see any additional questions up on the screen. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for uh, working through some of the technical difficulties today as we got the presentation working out. And I hope the, uh, the open forum worked out well for everyone to get a couple of questions answered that may have been um, hot topics for you or things that you've been hoping we would touch on the last few months. Um, and again, look for information in the next couple of days about the April 19th meeting. Start putting that on your calendar, and we look forward to seeing you then.